Hey, this is Kevin, and again, I'm talking about the most important thing in investing, and that's our brain, and how we think about things uh, very much affects how we invest our money. And uh, if we think about things uh, in error, which we do all the time, and that includes me, we will have a lot of trouble investing. And so this, uh, this uh, presentation, it's going to be a little bit cerebral, but I'm going to use lots of data and show you some nice fancy charts. So if you're into investing, you should, you should somewhat enjoy this presentation, I hope. Anyway, a different kind of investment risk. Frame of reference risk is the first risk I'm going to talk about. This is the risk that if you live in Italy, you're going to hear about the Italian uh, stock market every day. I don't know if there's a big market there. Maybe you won't hear about it every day. You'll talk about food. But if you live in uh, Australia, you're going to hear about the Australian stock market. Well, here in the U.S., we either hear about the Dow Jones or the S&P every day. Um, in, in the last decade, which I'm going to show you in a minute, you would have been very depressed to have owned the S&P 500 over a 10-year time period. Horrible reports about the S&P and the Dow being down. Um, Last uh, six years, you would be depressed if you owned anything but the S&P 500. So the wisdom I'm trying to bring here is, uh, and this goes back 80 years, history repeats itself over and over again, business cycles, yada, 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 is that the last year or two, I've, I've been hearing a lot of people upset about owning anything but the S&P 500. And uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to make at least the argument why I think you should invest uh, worldwide and invest in different asset classes. At the end of the day, if you can't stand um, the reference risk, if uh, every day you hear about the S&P 500, and if it does well, you're uh, uh, jealous, well, then we should just invest you in the S&P 500 and be done with it. Um, the other bias is uh, called recency bias. And again, with our brain, this thing between our ears, we, we think about like, you know, it's the tendency to think about the trends and patterns we observe in the recent past will continue. And they say predicting things uh, even for highly changeable events like weather or the stock market. So if it rains three days in a row, we wake up the fourth day and we say, I bet it's raining. Um, that's just the way, the way again, uh, we've developed our brain. So let's go ahead and start looking at some data here. And um, I just went through the presentation. Apologize for that. But Looking at returns differently or the power of recency bias. And so would you invest in this asset class? Look at this chart here. Now charts are interesting and you say, well, I would never invest just based on a chart. People do it all the time and we, and I do it all the time. We, we all do it. Um, so this is a 10 year time period through two, uh, 1999 through 2009. And would you invest in this asset class? Well, you start with a million dollars. It goes up to $1.2 million. Yeah, you're happy. It goes down to $700,000. And, and, and this, this chart, we look at it, we go, okay, I see the end here. You're down 26.84%. But in real days, we wake up every day. We wake up every day. We wake up every day. And we say, should we continue to do this? Should we continue to do this? Should we correct our course? Well, right here, you're starting to wonder and say, maybe I shouldn't be investing in this asset class. When it goes back up here, and you have $1.4 million, you're no longer saying that. When it goes back down, right here, you're depressed again. All during this, this crash, you're saying, why are we invested in this? Why are we invested in this? And over this 10-year time period, this is the lost decade, and this is the S&P 500. This is the asset class that has done so well the last six years. Well, same, same data time period here, 1999 through... Um, this says through uh, 2000 and uh, almost uh, uh, 10, 2009. The blue is the Barclays, uh, and that's the old um, Lehman Brothers uh, bond uh, index. So it was up 74%. So you start with a million, you would have $1.7 million. Be very happy. Once again, the S&P 500 during this time period, very unhappy. And so why didn't we just invest in bonds during this time period? Well, that's because uh, past time periods, stocks did better. Emerging markets. Um, if you started investing in emerging markets, and I picked this uh, time period here only because EEM, that's a uh, emerging markets uh, ETF, that's when it started. But if you started in 2003, 
you would have been extraordinarily happy. You would have had a million dollars going all the way uh, uh, over $3 million. You would have been very happy to own that the first four years. Now, nobody would invest all their money in emerging markets. I'm just using that to make the point. Then you would have been depressed for a couple of years. Again, in real time, every day, every day, we're trying to decide, are we doing the right thing? And then the market comes back up again, emerging markets come back up again. Now, the last three years, uh, every year, and um, I get this from uh, most, most people, uh, most advisors even, is that emerging markets stink. Emerging markets stink. They're, they're, they're not going to come back. Strong dollar, emerging markets, too many problems, they stink. And so, uh, last three years, you have a negative four, negative four, negative 13. Uh, should you stop investing in emerging markets based off the last year? We should never invest in emerging markets again. Well, if I said that, I'd probably be wrong. I can't tell you for sure, but I'd probably be wrong. REITs, real estate, 2000, and uh, this is actually a decade here, 2005 to 15. Uh, real estate has done about as well as the S&P 500, $1.62 million if you started with a million dollars. But look, you actually have a crash in 2007. So in real time, if you started investing in REITs any of this time period and you saw your money go down 17% in 2007, you would probably be a little bit upset. 2008 was when the major crash came with stocks and... Um, that's you know it crashed again there and so at some point in 2009 if you started in 2005 you'd ask yourself why are we doing this this is stupid um, and then you would have missed all of this great growth and so you can see the last number of years things have been outstanding this year um, REITs have not performed at all it's just uh, zero growth merging markets are S&P 500 over the last and this is, again, when Emerging Market uh, ETF was founded. Which one would you prefer to be in? Well, the S&P 500, awesome these last five years. The years before that, not so hot. Emerging Market screamed up, as I showed you. Screamed down. Screamed back up. And they've been doing very poorly recently. You still would have had $2.68 million if you invested in emerging markets during this time period versus the S&P 500. $2 million, nothing to sle uh, sneeze at. Small caps. So S&P 500 is the largest five, 500 companies based on capitalization. That's how much money is invested. Small caps are the 2,000 smaller companies, also known as the Russell 2000. They're still large companies. They're not mom and pop, but they're smaller companies as far as investing goes. Um, the yellow here is um, the Russell 2000, or the Vanguard Small Cap Index. The yellow has done better over the last 10 years. Uh, you would have 1.77 million versus the 1.34 million. But once again, in the last two years, small cap has not done well, and large cap has done well. This year... Small cap is down um, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent, depending on which index you're looking at. And so, again, we're asking ourselves if we put money in in 2015, why are we doing that? MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships. Um, interesting asset class, um, pipes, infrastructure. Um, has done extraordinarily well over the last three decades. This year has done awful, terrible. Um, it's not just based on the price of oil. It's also based on credit and many other things. But um, why are we investing in MLPs? That's the question uh, right now that even I ask myself. Um, it's very painful to invest in them. Uh, will they uh, ever do well? Uh, again, I don't know. 2006 through 2000. And 13, they did as well, and sometimes better, than the S&P 500. So um, this is just the cycle of investing. Foreign versus U.S. This is a huge one for me right now. So many people have said uh, strong dollar, foreign markets uh, stink, uh, emerging markets in trouble. Well, this is the EFA, which is uh, Europe, Far East, Australasia. And... Um, this is, again, when the ETF was formed. That's why I picked this time period. 
But um, 2002 to the present, what you can see here is foreign is yellow. Foreign was much higher, uh, much higher, much higher, much higher, much higher. It crashed, but still was a little bit higher all the way through 2012. Then for a year and a half, they went kind of together in the last couple of years. S&P 500 took off. Foreign has rolled over and rolled over again. So we shouldn't invest in foreign, right? Well, during most of this time period, you would have been happier if you invested in foreign markets. But um, it's starting to get depressing with foreign. So the total world. Now, the yellow, again, is just foreign. The U.S. is just blue. If you invested in the world, that would be orange uh, here, here in uh, home of uh, the Tennessee Vols. Um, it's not quite the Tennessee Vol orange, but um, that's the reason why I believe in world investing. I mean, most of the time period here, you would be very happy. And again, we wake up every day. I say that a lot, but we wake up every day and we say, is this good what we're doing? We, we ask ourselves that constantly. Uh, someone else tells us right now, don't invest in the world. Just invest in the S&P 500. And uh, it seems like a good argument the last few years. Okay, so since the last decade, um, nothing's uh, beat the S&P 500 except for maybe REITs in the last five years. This is March 2009 to, to present. The bond market, I showed you that it was it dominated during that 10-year 10, 10 time period, the Barclays, formerly Lehman Bond uh, Index. Uh, it's up uh, 33% only a 4.37% annualized return. Recently, bonds have been down last couple years. So what will do well the last part of this 2015 and beyond in 2016 and 17 and 18, what will do well? Well, S&P 500, the day I did this, was uh, uh, up... Um, is flat really and the bond market was up one percent uh, during this year although there were times in this year it was down um, and it's kind of gone back down again but uh, merging markets down 13 percent this year uh, Europe is uh, flat this year some parts of the Far East Australasia have been down 10 percent what will do well well I would just in closing go back to the first slide and say recency bias uh, we think what will do well in the future is things that are doing well currently um, and again the S&P 500 has been the biggest winner in the last six years there was a time in real time when you would ask yourself the question why are we doing this and you will ask yourself that question again with the S&P 500 so I believe in world diversification. I believe in stocks and bonds. I believe in MLPs and REITs. I believe in all of it. Um, the percentage of, of that you'll have is based on um, your reference risk. Are you willing to be different than the herd? Are you willing to be different than the herd? And uh, if you're not willing to be different than the herd, it's okay. Let's just understand ourselves and say that we're just going to invest in the S&P 500. But if you're willing to be different th than the herd, you will get, as I showed you on that worldwide um, fund, you will get very good returns over decades. I can't tell you what's going to happen next year. No one can. So thank you so much for watching. I, uh, I appreciate it. I love feedback. Any feedback you have. Thank you.